My name is uh, David Woodbury. I'm the president of the Historical Society, and I'm tonight's poobah. And uh, we're going to be talking about uh, delivering the mail and all the things that that means. Yeah, if you would turn off the turn off the front lights and leave the back lights, that's probably the best. Um, I want to begin by saying that there's an awful lot we don't know about uh, delivering the mail in New Boston in the early days. But what we do know, we have Laurier Michaud to thank for it. Um, probably a lot of you don't remember him, but some of you do. And Laurier was a nice, kindly gentleman who uh, lived where Judy Knight now lives, in a different house. Um, <laughs> and uh, took quite an interest in the library and, and must have been one of the founders of perhaps one of the founders of the Historical Society because he did a lot of work uh, on, on this project as well as others. And what's amazing to me is that when he wanted information about the Postal Service, he would write to the post office, I don't know whether he wrote to Washington, but I think he may have, and he would get an answer back. They, they, they would write him a letter and they'd tell him what he wanted to know. But in any case, um, we know that uh, that there was a postal route established as early as 1791, and it um, it had to it went where you can see that it wasn't this was not the only postal route in the whole state, of course, but this is the one that served New Boston, and you would begin in Concord. And though I'm I'm I'm, I'm kind of guessing because I can't read I can't read these names any better than you can because they're fuzzy. But they would head west out to the Connecticut River area and swing down through all the towns until they came to uh, New Boston, which I, I can read, which is here. And I think that must be Goffstown, I'm not sure, possibly where. Um, and then back to Concord. And that route took a week. And, uh, and then it would begin all over again. Now, how the mail got to Concord in the first place isn't isn't clear. Um, this was back in the days long before there was a railroad, so there wasn't any speedy delivery of mail. It's hard to imagine what you'd have to to uh, to wait for as far as mail is concerned. But apparently, it did uh, it did circul circulate that way in this area, and. Uh, then, uh, probably most of you are aware, uh, New Boston in those early years, in the 1790s up through about 1825, New Boston consisted of a settlement what in what's today is known as the Upper Village, and it centered around this house, which if you have sharp eyes, you can see uh, it's the same house that's there today. Uh, that, then in those days it was the home of Sidney Hills. Today it's the home of Peter Clark. Uh, and it doesn't quite look like that. Uh, this is kind of an interesting thought that when the, uh, when the New Boston history was put together in 1864, they, had, they illustrated quite a few of the prominent New Boston homes by lithograph. And if that doesn't look like it was perhaps in Brookline, Massachusetts, or someplace like that. I mean, it certainly doesn't give the flavor of New Boston. It's a uh, sort of fancy lady with a parasol and a son walking by and a, and a horse and buggy driving into the yard and a man carrying a rake. And uh, so I think they took a little artistic license. But that's, that's kind of where the... Uh, where the life of the village was. And it wasn't just the, uh, the Peter Clark home, which of course is there today. There are several other homes at that intersection which date back to that time. Uh, but we don't know exactly what business or what activity took place in what house. Uh, but we know that there were quite a few businesses around. There was a slaughterhouse and a tannery and uh, a lot of commercial activity. 
We know that New Boston had its first official postmaster in 1816. It was a gentleman named Levi Bixby. Uh, not much is known about him or exactly where he did business. But uh, according to Cogswell, a, a lot of the commercial activity took place in and around the Sydney Hills homestead. And, uh, you know, we're used to thinking of that of that house and all the other houses as being residences, which they were in part, but they had an awful lot more going on than just living quarters. And apparently this is a, a, a good candidate for uh, where the postmaster held forth in the 18-teens and the 1820s. And then um, at some point in time, it became clear, I, I think it must have been, it should have been clear a lot sooner than it was, uh, that the upper village had some drawbacks. Uh, one of the things that, to keep in mind about the upper village is that the principal road from the south, from the Amherst Milford area, came over what is now Joe English Road, not so much what's now Route 13. So that you, you can imagine all these all these wagons and carriages trudging up the hill by Don Grosso's house and then coming down the other side uh, and, and ending up in ending up in the upper village, but that's what they did. And uh, so we think we think that if that isn't the actual first post office in New Boston, it's it's close and you'll have to you can kind of use your own imagination about that, but we have the next slide, please. Uh, the next, you'll recognize that house because that's still there today. It looks almost the same. That's the house that we think um, a gentleman named Waterman Burr, who had had a place of business and was the postmaster in the upper village, moved down to. And uh, that's the house, of course, that you almost run into on a slippery day when you come down from the dump. And uh, it was it was built. Um, yeah, I'm not I'm not sure who lives there today, but uh, it's uh, it's the house where Sylvia Chancy had a restaurant in the early '70s when she was there. So that house has a long history of being involved in in businesses in uh, in New Boston and Waterman Burr stayed uh, postmaster for quite a number of years. Yeah, he, he established himself as postmaster in 1829 and he was in it until 1853. And then uh, it didn't take long there was a, a John Gregg and a James Gregg who had the position in the 1850s, 1853 and 1855. But then, uh, then we have Solomon Atwood in 1861. Now Solomon Atwood is the man who for many, many years ran what's now called Dodger's Store. He didn't run it at first. It was a different building. We'll talk about that in a minute. But um, this is, uh, this is where New Boston's commercial hub really started. And then uh, if we go to the next slide, this is the slide that I, I want you to remember this. And this is an important uh, picture for a lot of reasons. Um, I'm, sure, I'm sure a good many of you know what that is and, and where you are when you're looking at it. But it's, it's what's now Dodger's store. And in fact, in those days, it was Dodge's store as well. The, uh, the owner was a CW Dodge. And we, we have a detailed picture coming up in a minute. Of but uh, the, the mystery in this picture is what, what's going on here? Um, first of all, you have a large group of people who are centered around the store. That some of them, at least, have come in horses and sleighs. But there's snow on the ground, but there's mud too. So what do you make of that? 
and um, and they're all men. If if you if there's a little boy or, or a, it's like a middle a middle school age boy. But if you can find a woman in that crowd, I hope you'll point out. And as a matter of fact, I, when we go through these pictures, if any of you have anything to say about them, please do say it. Uh, because there are plenty of mysteries here that uh, perhaps you can help me with. But um, this is, you'll see it. Uh, can we have the detail? Yeah, this is, this is the post office. Um, and of course, the, he's telling you uh, cash and barter. Um, I don't know. I'm not sure what. I'm sure he's. I'm sure he's telling you. Uh, please don't ask for credit. You know. <laughs> you know that's that's what that's what's going on here. But uh, here's another thing that may help. Of course, you've got a sign that tells you that Goffstown is six miles that way and Concord is 21 miles that way, which still is today, they're still in the same place. Um, but um, notice there's a poster here that says rally. Now we can't read what it is. Uh, who's rallying what group of people for what purpose. But this is, uh, this is clearly an event. You know, what people have, uh, people have uh, put their sleighs together, come down, they've got, I won't say they're dressed up, I don't think you can say that they're really dressed up. There's a couple of gents with high hats, but, um, and there's a photographer, and photography in those days was not a simple matter, and uh, you had to, you had to know in advance you were going to take a picture of something, so there had to be a reason why all those people are there, why there's a photographer recording the event, and, uh, the only thing we can, I can think of, and maybe you can think of something different, is that it could have been, it could have been town meeting, uh, where the town meeting would have been held in the town hall, which is where located where the present town hall is, although it's a different building out here. Um, and maybe, maybe they've broken for lunch, you know, and they've gone over to Dodger's store to get a sandwich, but. Uh, the and the women couldn't vote. And uh, I don't know, if you've got any ideas, help me out. But anyway, C.W. Dodge was postmaster for only a very short time. And then, uh, and then the, the position moved on. We have the next slide. Um, now this, isn't, this probably is not the post office, but something's happened. And you can see, if you remember what we were just looking at, something's happened to the same building. Um, we know the date of this. This is uh, taken in August, August 22, 1885. So if the, other, if the other photograph we were looking at was 1868, which I think it was, something's happened. And of course they've had a new, st a, a new story to the building but what they've done, which is amazing to me, is they didn't just tear the roof off and build a new second story, a new third story. They jacked the entire building up high enough to build this part under it. Which, because if you, if you look at the way the windows are, the windows that are on the ground floor in that picture are on the second floor in that picture. And, uh, the, the engineering involved in doing that and the risk in doing that, can you imagine on a high wind? Or, I, I, I just don't know. But uh, they've, uh, they've improved it. Uh, you can see they've added some, uh, some decorative shingles here. Instead of the ordinary clapboards, they've dressed the building up a bit. Now, here's something that we've puzzled over in this picture, and that is what is Barnum? I mean, we all know that Barnum is a circus. But would a circus be advertising uh, in New Boston? Um, we just don't know. Maybe, maybe some of you know what Barnum is or what Barnum meant in the 1880s. Uh, or whether, whether, whether people would 
go to the circus from New Boston and how you would get there. We assume the circus might have come to Manchester. But to get to Manchester in 1885 from New Boston was an event because the train hadn't started yet. And uh, you've got 15 or so miles. It takes several hours to get there and several hours to get back. So anyway, if you have some ideas about that, speak up because we're going to see Barnum again. Um, this, this is an interesting picture because this is where the next post office was. It went from uh, what the, the previous Dodge to C.H. Dodge. And this, uh, my understanding is that C.H. Dodge was Homer's, Homer's grandfather. Uh, this picture is kind of interesting and it's a little bit easy to date. There's a picture almost like this, but it isn't the same picture that hangs in the town clerk's office. And uh, we can see a couple of guys posing in front of the store, and one of them has a bicycle. Uh, and that allows you to date the picture fairly closely because you couldn't have a proper bicycle until you had invented the uh, pneumatic tire. And that, uh, that didn't happen until Mr. Dunlop in, uh, in England did it in the early 1890s. So this is, uh, this is the post office and the store um, after, after the one we just saw. Now notice in this picture, of course, you've got Barnum again. And, but notice the house, the, the large, kind of shabby looking house behind an uphill. Uh, that's, a, that's an intriguing building. And it's a, it's a large, well, I, I can't say it's a fancy house, but it's, it's a substantial frame house that's weathered, it's not in good condition. And then you can see that the, the white cape uh, behind the store is the one that's still there. So that, that hasn't changed. But uh, this, is, this is where the post office was and, uh, in the, and probably in the 1880s. Now this gets into another, another issue that we should mention, and that is the post office was a financial benefit to whoever was the postmaster. Not only did you get fees for doing the posting, but if you had a store, it brought people into your store. So it was a highly sought after uh, position. And uh, the post office changed hands in an interesting way in this period of time. Now, those of you who are students of American history will know that uh, in well, in the election of 1880, James Garfield was elected. Shortly thereafter, he was assassinated, and Chester Arthur took the remainder of his uh, term. And, they, and both of them were uh, Republicans. But in 1884, what, what should happen but that Grover Cleveland was elected. And uh, Grover Cleveland was a Democrat. And guess what? The post office changed hands. It went, it went from what's now Dodge's store over to that Dodge's store. Uh, but by the time that had happened, the, the old Dodge's store had, was, was run by and owned by Atwood. So Atwood, apparently Atwood was a Republican and the Dodge's were Democrats. So he got the post office for that period of time. Now in 1888, the, the next presidential election, who should be elected but Benjamin Harrison, a Republican. And guess what happened to the post office? It went, it, it went back to, um, it went back to Atwood. And then that was only for one term. And guess what happened in 1892? Well, Grover Cleveland was elected again. It's the only time that somebody has been elected the presidency twice, but not consecutive terms. Uh, Donald Trump makes it this time. He'll be the next one to do that, but 
Uh, so far that hasn't happened, but it did happen in the 1880s. So, it, so back, goes the, back goes the post office. To, uh, but something else is happening at the same time. And uh, have the next slide. Now this this is a, you know we were just looking at Dodger store. Well, we're still looking at Dodger store, but we're, this is in, this is dated 1893. If we thought that the um, the other picture was dated from about 1890, there's been a huge change in a very short period of time. And uh, there's the can't quite read it, but that would be the post office sign. That's where it was. And in 1893, of course, guess who? Guess who's just been reelected? Grover Cleveland. Okay, it's the post office. But notice, you know, the building, of course, looks very much the same today. But that's when it was uh, very newly rehabbed. And uh, you know, it. it, it of course, you can see today that they've um, that Almas and Georgia have sort of weatherized the porch in front, so that. But otherwise, it's very it's very similar. So, so we'll get to the next one. Okay, this this we think we're pretty confident. This is the interior of that store of of the Dodger store in the 1890s, and. Uh, this is where the post office was. You can see people have got periodicals and magazines in their little cubbies. And then some of the people, I guess people who were more concerned about security, appear to have lock boxes down below, but most people didn't. I guess you could just go and take somebody else's mail if you wanted to. <laughs> Except we have two, uh, two stalwart guardians of peace and tranquility. You see them sitting behind that wicket. It's not easy to see. There's a man and a woman sitting there, and they seem completely unconcerned with the photographer. They're not posing. <laughs> and uh, whether whether they're post office related or whether they're just you know, maybe that's just the checkout counter of the of the Dodger store at the time. And uh, interesting to note, there certainly appear to be incandescent light bulbs there. I if you. It's hard to know what those are, but electricity came to uh, to New Boston fairly early, and uh, I don't know which. Maybe maybe some of the more alert members would know whether electricity predated telephone or telephone predated like I think electricity came first, um, but that that was the inside. That was the post office during the uh, Grover Cleveland administration. So can we go to the next slide? But now things have changed. This is this is later. And this is back, you know, when things have returned to normal, you know, under re Republican uh, presidents. Um, you see, the, this is Dodge's store. That, that shouldn't be a mystery to anybody. Uh, we've got the post office boxes here. Um, Homer Dodge, this is probably taken in I don't really. I don't remember. I'm sure some of you could tell me the year Homer was born. But Homer is the young man standing kind of where the deli is today, and his father is the obviously that's Ben Dodge. And then uh, I think we have names for the other men in the picture, but I don't recall them exactly. But what intrigues me about this picture is not not only that. This has some real familiarity to us today and some very unfamiliarity in the same picture. But what are those bottles? <laughs> Here, 15 cents a bottle. Well, they could, it could have been beer, but they look like champagne bottles, but I know they weren't champagne bottles. Um, I'm sure they weren't wine. I, I, 25 cents and 50 cents. Anyway. Um, I, I, I just don't know. They obviously stocked a lot of it and they expected to sell a lot of it, whatever it is. And, uh, and they've got cigars here um, and all the uh, kind of usual canned goods. I'm sure they, I'm sure that picture, if you 
able to look at it closely enough, you'd find that device that Homer had, which would grab up things, which very much like this device, which is quite the same thing. But we'll get into that later. But uh, we have the next slide, please. Okay, this is at about the same time. This is while the post office was at Dodges. There's a sign, and. Uh, you can see, I, I don't have a firm date for this picture, but there was substantial, I think, I think those are, I don't know whether that's electric lines or telephone lines. Maybe some of you could tell from the poles, which, which it is. Uh, but electricity and modernization has come to New Boston. You can see that the apple barn has a cupola, which it doesn't have today. And it doesn't, it doesn't have the chimney, which almost cost them the, the barn a few years ago when they had a chimney fire. But um, one of the things that's interesting about this picture, which if you look at the original print, and uh, maybe some of you can help me with this, you will see right here, which you can't read in this, but it, it's a sign on the side of the building, and it, one of the words in it is scales. And my thought, my thought was, and it doesn't look like an advertisement. It's not like Fairbanks Morse, which is a scales company, was advertising their wares. I, I think that Dodges could easily have had a public scale um, as you pulled your wagon into the, you know, same area where you would drive your car today if you wanted to park there. Um, but I can't, I can't, we can't find any evidence that they did. Uh, I guess maybe if you went into the store and went down in the basement, maybe you'd see some evidence that uh, there was the remains of a scale. We know that Fr Francistown has a scale, which they treasure today, um, but uh, maybe maybe we could have had one, but who knows. Anyway, that's, uh, that's, that's what... That's what Dodgers looked like at about 1900 when the post office was there. And what's next? Okay, this is this is a much later. This is an interior view of the new Boston Post Office when it had moved sideways from inside the Dodgers store area to its own area, which had been the Whipple Free Library at that you know when it was built. Uh, and then when the Whipple Free Library moved, which was 1927. And then the post office moved with it away from the in part of the store, and uh, but here's this is Gus. We'll talk more about Gus Andrews later, but he's got um, he's got a new post office in a new area, and um, so that's that's you know it's a it's a proper post office on its own, and of course Gus. Um, was no longer, he, he wasn't a storekeeper, he was a purpose-built postmaster, which is what he did. So, um, now we can, we, we're getting into, this of course is something that we have across the street that was uh, kindly donated to us by, uh, by Nyreen Boudreau, uh, and it, was, it, it, took, it took an awful lot to get it out of their house. That thing weighs a ton and had to be disassembled, partly disassembled, and that's a post office sorting box that was in use, I think, even even up to Bob Frame's period. So that, that's part of it. And of course then we've got a couple of um, a couple of examples of the uh, post office boxes. Gail, you have, you. what was your number? 77. <laughs> and and yeah, you, you saved yours. I mean, the, the, when they when they moved the post office out of there, they allowed... They even actually mounted it on a board. We were living in Ohio at the time, and he actually mounted it on a board and sent it to us. It's a wonderful <laughs> souvenir. <laughs> I'm sorry we don't have a picture of that one, but we've got, uh, we've got those. Now we now we can now we can begin to talk a little bit about some of the people that uh, that some of you remember, and I, I think some of you here are going to remember all the people that we're going to talk about. 
But of course, this is Gus Andrews. Gus, uh, Gus uh, was in the military, stationed is in the Army Air, Air Corps, was stationed at the bombing range in New Boston during the war, and he and his fellow soldiers lived in, I think they must have lived in what we call the Wigwam, which is uh, no longer there. But uh, after the war, he became, uh, he became New Boston's first First postmaster that wasn't that wasn't also a storekeeper. I mean, his his duty and his place of business was separate and apart, and it's a, a you know a, a professional operation. And of course, he's got signs selling as a post office above his head. This is taken in 1963, and he's he's waving. And um, but he was a fixture in town, as you know. He was. He was described, and I know some of you knew him a lot better than I ever did, as a, he's described as being very opinionated. He, he, um, I don't know, do you, do you have some, I, I mean, was that a fair description of, of Gus? You know, I mean, you know, I, I always just thought he was just sort of a nice guy who worked in the post office, but somebody, somebody wrote that about him. And uh, but he he carried on as postmaster until from 1948 to about 1975. And as postmaster, he was the next before Bob Frame, whom you all remember because he's with us today, um, but not as postmaster. But uh, Gus lived in one of the one of the houses. I'm not sure exactly which one on Old Coach Lane, uh, one of the ones that you pass it just as you turn to go up to the dump. So he lived close to town. And uh, he lived for a number of years. He died in the 1980s. His, I think his wife Lucille survived him. Uh, but we have a bunch of pictures of him. On this, uh, well, this is sort of a double header because we're going to be talking about Frank Wilson um, at some point in time. But his, this is Gus, and Frank is retiring in 1957, and Gus is congratulating him on his years of, of service. And in fact, he, he had a remarkable run as a rural carrier. Uh, he served in World War I, came back from World War I, and almost immediately joined up as a rural carrier in the Boston. The first years that he worked, uh, there were two routes, but in 1933, it could have been a, it could have been a, you know, a money-saving move. Uh, the other carrier disappeared, and Frank had the entire, entire run of the town, and uh, here he is retiring in 1957, the usual kind of. I don't know whether they gave him a gold watch, but they certainly gave him a handshake. <laughs> but. Um, I remember Frank as a as an elderly gentleman. He didn't he didn't just disappear after he stopped being a, a mail carrier. He did a bunch of things, including being on the uh, highway department. Yeah. He's a person who would, in fact, I remember him as the person who would come and clean the, the ditches, clean the culverts. Yes. And um, I don't know whether he did that because it was a, it was a it was a great job to do it. I don't think it was. I think it might have. Might have represented kind of a kind of a, a downgrade, but, but anyway, he was. But uh, I remember having a very pleasant conversation with him as a in the 1970s when he would have been. He was born about 1900, so he's in his 70s at the time. And uh, but that's not uh, that's not where he his, that's not what we really have him here to t to talk about. But, but more like this, uh, he, had, he had a 1924 Model T Ford Roadster, which that wasn't a homemade thing. That was, uh, that was a snowmobile. And the, the name and the term snowmobile were known and trademarked and everything. I, but uh, those, um, you can see what they've done. Uh, of course, it had to be awful cold. You know, those things, you're just, you're, you're sitting basically in a, in a, in a tiny convertible uh, in the middle of winter, handing out mail. 
but they've uh, they've rigged up a deal whereby this is the normal rear axle for a Model T Ford, and they've added the frame, and they've put another axle and another wheel and a tread, and then given skis on the front, oh. and taken the fenders off, um, and that's what he used to deliver the bail. But this is an advertisement for the company that uh, he dealt with. It's the snowmobile company of West Ossipee, New Hampshire. Um, and uh, this is an advertisement. That they're, they're very proud of the fact that this is now 1926, and that's a, uh, a 1926 model, model T Roadster uh, instead of the, the, the junky old one that, that, you wouldn't, that, you would, that you would want to trade in for one of these. And um, so, you know, I, I don't know who um, who trademarked the snowmobile, but somebody did. And you wonder if they, if somebody, if, you wonder if somebody kept the trademark all these years and had to be bought out when Bombardier and Skidoo and all those were starting to make their vehicles. But that's that's an example of what <coughs> what one would look like. Um, in in service, I don't know where that that's a file picture. I don't know where where that is or anything about it. But that's that's sort of a typical a typical one. But there was a problem here, and the problem is, um, and I want you to go back and remember the picture of the of the group around the then the then the then Dodges store. Uh, it's it's mud. But they're using sleighs. Well, it's a combination of mud and snow. But um, when you when you had a horse and sleigh, you didn't want the roads plowed. What you wanted was the roads to be packed, you know, solid um, solid snow, and the horse and the sleigh would would go right along. Uh, the, um, as, as time went on, and more and more people gave up sleighs, and more and more people brought in cars, uh, the, the public sentiment changed dramatically, and people desperately, by the, time, by the time these Model T snowmobiles were really getting going, there was a real move afoot to plow the roads. And um, Dick Moody is an example of a tractor that was a very early one for, of its kind to do that. But plowing the roads was incompatible with horse and sleigh. So there was a big tug and a tug of war between the factions uh, that either wanted the roads plowed and so they could drive in the normal way, although cars in those days probably had chains on their rear wheels. but. Uh, but uh, that kind of left the snowmobile that kind of stuck in the middle because the snowmobile um, snowmobile was basically a motorized horse is what it amounted to and um, they weren't any good on the uh, on a plowed road so they had a they had a very brief heyday you know they had to the point when when Ford was turning out Model Ts to the max would be after World War One, to the time when they started plowing roads routinely uh, for cars was only a period of about five years. So these uh, these snowmobiles had, had a limited life, and I don't know. Maybe some of you do. Uh, how long Frank Wilson was able to use his Model T snowmobile, but not not very long. And sadly, it doesn't, doesn't exist today. That, that I know of, but we have other pictures that show the situation that uh, prevailed in later years. These pictures are from Merrill Todd's photo album, and uh, we'll, we'll have more of them coming up. But the one at the, t the top left, if you can read it, it says Joe Kennedy Mud. Um, that Joe Daniels Road. Well, Joe Daniels Road is what's now Laurel Lane, and, um, and Joe Joe Kennedy is practically up to his knees in mud. And then the next picture to the right, the top right, 
the, it's a 1930 Model A Ford in a picture that was taken in April 1960. So you can see those uh, Model A Fords had a really long service life. Uh, and somebody's, somebody's driving it in the usual course, but they got into a mud hole and you know, they sat. And then um, the couple of pictures here that uh, are to say Foster, Foster Hill, which is, which is by the Moody's. Yeah, that's, 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 that's part of, it's what now is Bedford Road. That's Bedford Road you're Bedford, looking at. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and, the, and these are 19, these are 1960, so. Um, but this is, uh, you know, Merrill Todd uh, was uh, an amateur photographer and he, he wanted to document the conditions that he was uh, going through. And uh, those are the, and those are some of them. And then you'll you'll remember this because those of you who remember Merrill Todd, who um, he was born in 1911, I think, and uh, died in 1980. He lived to be a, an elderly gentleman. Um, but he was uh, he was our first postman, and that was his car, and. Uh, so I've got a bunch of pictures uh, of, uh, that he took, and we have snow. We have mud. this is a this is a picture that was taken um, on Wilson Hill, and it's it's labeled near where uh, Nellie Chancy would now be Sylvia Chancy's home, but that's that's Wilson Hill, and that's. Um, I don't know whether he brought his own shovel. I suppose he must have. Um, but uh, and whether the, whether the shovel was able to do any good, I can't imagine. I can't imagine that he'd be able to do much with it. But there's there's another one. I don't know. I don't know whether the car is stuck or whether he was able to simply drive out of that. And and when he did get stuck, what did he do? So. There we have Merrill and Gus, the sort of standard picture. This is uh, this is Merrill retiring from his job as a rural carrier in 1973, and good old Gus is there to give him the same old same old handshake that he gave Frank Wilson, <laughs> and, uh, wish him well. And, and Gus Gus was pretty much on his way towards retirement at that point as well. But uh, Merrill, is a, I remember him, and I'm sure a lot of you do too, he's a very cheerful man, and nothing seemed to faze him. And uh, in fact, you would know that nothing would faze him if you saw him driving through the mud. <laughs> which is, uh, David, did you want to mention that tool there? Did you want to mention the, the Hawkeye or whatever? Yes, hang on. I don't have hands on it. Yeah, one of um, Sharon Todd Elliott kindly brought this in. This is this is Gus's device, and actually it has, if I can read. Yeah. It's the, uh, the the Mail Hawk Warm Springs, Georgia. And if you want one of these, you can buy one today uh, for a right modest price. Uh, Dan found a website where these things are still being sold, but. Uh, Merrill, because Merrill's VW was a standard VW with a left-hand steering wheel, um, he had to reach across to do, uh, do the mailboxes, and there's a hook. There's a hook on the end of it, so you could open the mailbox, and then, then you could put the mail in here. And it. Um, it wasn't until it wasn't until later. That uh, I think under Dan McCreary, that Dan finally got a right-hand drive car, which solved some of these things. Uh, this is a good picture. This is uh, this is uh, a picture taken in, the, in a time when most of you would remember. Of course, this is a reenactment of somebody had a Concord coach, and they wanted to reenact delivering the mail. 
I'm sorry? Well, yes, okay, well, the, the photograph, the photograph is taken by uh, Carolyn Duke, Duke of Duke Photo, and she was a Goffstown News person, like as Gail was, I don't know whether you overlapped with her or not, but... But yes, those are the those are the Duke. That's uh, Gus, of course. And I think it's not given credit, but I'm sure the man in the box driving is Merrill Todd. Um, I, Sharon, Sharon isn't sure, but I, I think it is. And I think that I think that was, of course, by design. Somebody wanted to post that picture, and Merrill was around, and he perhaps hadn't retired yet or was about to retire, and they put him up there as a as the driver of the stagecoach, and Gus is posing. But those are the Duke girls. Uh, this is the, the bigger girl is Mandy Duke and uh, Darcy Duke, and they went uh, they went through uh, the Boston Central School. Uh, Mandy, Mandy, we we keep in touch with them because they were very important in the lives of our of our girls as as sort of like big sister types. Mandy lives in in. in uh, Noblesville, Indiana, I think, and Darcy is a librarian at MIT, where she went to college, and lives in Somerville. So, but uh, what's what's clear to me is that Mandy, uh, Darcy, I'm sorry, the the younger girl, the littler girl, isn't very happy about having her. <laughs> whereas, uh, whereas Mandy's okay with it. She's, but. Uh, and if you look in the very far left-hand corner of the picture, somebody is wearing a buckskin jacket with fringes, and I, I, I bet that's their dad, Phil Duke, who's, who still lives in Hillsborough, New Hampshire. We see him once in a while. But uh, this is this is like the post office gang and, and the Duke family from 1974. Now we move along. We, uh, now we've got Dan McCreary, who most I'm sure most of you remember Dan. Dan took over from Merrill, and I think for perhaps not all of his career, but most of his career, he was still a sole <laughs> mail carrier in in New Boston. Um, and uh, he uh, Dan was a was a cheerful guy. He came from the Billford area, and uh, he wasn't he wasn't locally brought up, except if you call Milford local, he was, he was that local, but he wasn't a New Boston kid. And he came to town, um, so he, uh, he had been in the Navy and had uh, been in a serious motorcycle accident with a, with a closed head injury, and it affected his speech. It didn't affect much else, but he, uh, he, when, he when he spoke, he had kind of a, kind of a slurring in his speech, so, so something going on there and he was kind of a free spirit and uh, later married uh, Jeannie McCreary, his, his widow who just passed away very very recently and they lived they lived in one point in the little house that is almost where Walt Kirsch's mill is today or the remains of Walt Kirsch's mill and they later on lives on High Street and uh, an interesting note that I found in our files is that there was a point in time, and maybe Don, you can help me with this, there's a point in time in the 1970s where there was a proposal for a new post office. It was oh, yes. never it was never built. No, it was uh, uh, and Dan McCreary was awarded the contract to build it. Um, can you shed any light on that? Yeah, I submitted a proposal one before the planning board and uh, it was not, at the time it was not popular because uh, a lot of people liked the old post office. But uh, it was hard to back out. If you were an older person trying to back out on Group 13, it was pretty Yeah, no so kidding. Anyway, I bid on it and uh, it was very controversial. There was a public hearing and, uh, and then there was a planning board meeting, which I was locked out of. I couldn't go to the meeting. I thought you were on the planning board. Was no, that, not at that time. Yeah. I got on the planning board after. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, uh, long story short, uh, I could have filed suit. Uh, my attorney said that I would win, and I decided I didn't want to file suit. So 16 years later, 
the postal service came to me and wanted me to build a post office, I said, I don't think I'm interested. <laughs> and they said, oh, no, you are. <laughs> but anyway, uh, we finally built it 16 years later. Well, do you have any, uh, uh, I'm curious about, because I never knew Dan was a contractor. I mean, he's a well, person. I'm not sure what happened. Uh, I, don't, I don't even recall uh, that taking place. Uh, you know, I had... Uh, that, that, at that time, I was a, I'm still a novice, but I was really a novice, and uh, I put together a package, and I'm not sure it would have been proper, to be honest with you. Oh. Oh. Well, it's, you know, that's interesting, too. This is, this is a publicity photo with uh, Dan, which you can almost not see. This is a very poor quality picture. Dan is delivering mail to Merrill Todd. Uh, and I, I think if this is, Sharon, would this be at the Brick House, or do you think this would have been at the, his house on Thornton Road? Um, what year is that? Well, if Dan came on board as a newly appointed rural carrier in 1970, let's say 1975, Yeah, he had a he had a house on Thornton Road during the time that I can remember. Well, previous to that, he had lived when Sharon and her sister were children lived in the house that uh, Peter Shea now lives in. Well, it's a very different house in those years, much smaller than it is today. And the last picture is uh, this is this is Bob Frayne. I don't go on at any great length about Bob, a wonderful guy, and he. Uh, he came on board as a very young man and spent his entire career from 1975 to 2009, which is 25, 30, well, call, it, call it 35 years, you won't be too far off. Um, but uh, there he is, and, and I guess that's, uh, that's, the end of our, that's the end of our presentation, but we'd be glad to a, go back to pictures that you want to see, or B, answer questions, which we can. Uh, and if none of those things work out, then we can go across the street and have some refreshments. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah.